Fátima. Muy bien. Muchísimas Thank gracias. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm so pleased to be here in this forum, even if I, I'm sad not to be there in person, to be able to follow the different presentations uh, that uh, you all are delivering. I hope that uh, uh, things change and I can uh, go there next time. And I hope that what I, what I talk to you goes in line with uh, what was uh, said till now. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it uh, all well. If not, please let me know. Well, uh, what I would like to do now in this talk is uh, well connect memory or the lack thereof with contemporary crisis, in particular, though not only the so-called refugee crisis of 2015. All this uh, connected to the after effects of colonialism, and I am particularly interested in the ongoing cycle of racial crisis in the post-unification Germany, invariably caused by the seemingly sudden and overwhelming appearance of the foreign obviously in the response to this so-called refugee crisis, which quickly moved from a self-declared culture of welcome with the meteoric rise of the neo-fascist alternative Für Deutschland, which is in turn instrumental in racializing the current crisis, the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic. Something that seems to be rather well known to many that were out of the uh, Germanic or German context. This is something that not only happened there, but it happened in, in all over in the rest of Europe and in the rest of the world in the US as well. I knew that this crisis in the German case started with the panic, uh, the, the, the racial crisis panic. It was a matter of, of, of maintaining a situation, a status quo, the racial crises are used to, to generate uh, uh, the understanding of Germanness that permanently excludes racial communities by perpetually positioning them as on German or Unger German. Uh, and what follows, I will focus on the role of archives, both hegemonic and decolonial, in making the visible or invisible the connection between this crisis and the colonial past and on their potential in making possible a different future the one that emerges from the crisis discourse. And I will begin here. I will begin here by saying that this is the Berlin's Museum Island in the, the city center, right on the former East-West divide, not a site that is usually linked to the idea of a racial crisis. Well, it holds uh, five museums, the Old National Gallery, uh, which presents the 19th century European art, the, the Bode Museum, which fe features Byzantine art, the Old Museum, which focuses on Greek uh, and Roman antiquity, the New Museum that houses a collection of ancient Egyptian art. Here you have the Nefertiti bust, currently valued in 350 million euro. <clears throat> and also the the, the, the Pergamon Museum, home of the Islamic uh, and Near Eastern art, including the Ishtar Gate in the uh, old city of Babylon. The vast majority of the more than one million annual visitors to the island are drawn to these latter two museums. In 2015, at the height of the so-called refugee crisis, which uh, brought nearly one million people, from, mostly from Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan to Germany. So uh, as many people as annually visit the Museum Island alone. Well, in 2015, we have the, these five museums uh, and the German Historic Museum started an initiative entitled Multaqua, the museum as a meeting point, refugees as guides in Berlin museums which offered free tours in Arabic to refugees from Iraq and Syria, tours given by guides who had been refugees themselves. The museums defined the project goals as follows. Well, the Syrian Iraqi artifacts exhibited in the museum Für Islamische Kunst and in the uh, Art Museum are outstanding testaments to the history of humankind. 
though experiencing the appreciation which the museum shows well, to the to the uh, to these cultural objects and from their homelands, we hope to strengthen their self-esteem and promote the confident and constructive introduction of the refugees into our societies. Uh, the guide tours uh, make reference to the interreligion roots and the common origins of the three world religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity cultures in the Eastern Mediterranean regions that are characterized uh, with a common past. Uh, the initiative uh, thus followed a clear a pedagogical goal, the integration into the German society through an education in tolerance and appreciation of humanity's common heritage as practiced in Europe. With this, the Multaka initiative is in line with the dominant narrative around the refugees crisis, Europe as a peaceful island of civility, stability and prosperity, surrounded by chaotic regions, a Middle East increasingly succumbing to radical Islam, a permanently under, underdeveloped and a war-torn Africa and an aggressive Russian empire threatening the continent's east. The crisis originating in these regions suddenly and unexpectedly reached Europe, which is being pulled into it and needs to find imminent solutions to overwhelming challenges. As uh, it so often uh, had to, to in the course of world history, in, within this framework, in the northwest, uh, uh, Europe functions as the global conscience with the European Union symbolizing Europe's successful reformation uh, after the 20th century crisis of totalitarian, totalitarianism confirming the continent's place as a center and gatekeeper of universal human rights. Location of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which could have been housed nowhere but in Western Europe, is the only space per definition safe from the threat of grave human rights violations. And while the court investigates war crimes in different parts of the world, every single case brought to trial so far was against an African defendant. This narrative of Europe's constant progress seemed to offer sufficient explanation for the stream of refugees to the continent from outside of Europe, but also from its Eastern to its Western part. But of course, the benevolent narrative of the enlightened continent of ignoring Europe's culpability not only in allowing the refugee crisis to escalate, but in creating many of its sources. Which brings me back to the Multaka project, viewed as representing both the best of enlightenment values and aiming at educating Muslim refugees in this tradition rather than excluding them. Accordingly, the project received massive and massively positive media responses almost all featuring tours in the Pergamon Museum with the Ishtar Gate as the favorite backdrop. Reports tended to have a similar hook, the meeting between the refugees and the beautiful art from their war-torn home countries. There's an inevitable pattern to these encounters. Summarized by The Guardian, I quote, the first question we usually get asked is, how did this all end up in Germany? Interestingly enough, this question is never answered, and only the international press hints at larger controversies around stolen colonial art. Instead, the typical and convenient response here presented by the New York Times, often the visitors say the art is probably better off in Berlin because so much in Syria has been destroyed by the war in the Islamic State. And the Guardian again quotes the director of the Museum for Islamic Arts as stating, some objects have a complicated history. My interest here is not in criticizing the Multaka project, but in the complicated history it is embedded in and in the reasons why this history remains unaddressed, both within the project and in general. The concerted rewriting of European 20th century history after the end of the Cold War combined post-fascist and post-socialist narratives into a Western capitalist success story. Absent, however, was <laughs> a third legacy in dire need of reassessment, Europe's colonial past. The refusal to engage with this past as internal to Europe's history also shaped the continent's vision of its future manifest in a steadily growing post-colonial population that remains un-European 
and in futile attempts to once and for all define and fortify Europe's physical, political, and identitarian borders. Borders which are imagined to be self-evident, stable, and natural, but which are, as Berlin's Museum Island strikingly shows, malleable, shifting, and largely imaginary, though very real nonetheless. How we remember as individuals and as collectives depends on how we perceive the now and where we envision ourselves going. Memory discourses make the past legible for our present, but they also define the limits of the imaginable future. Our understanding of our past that is always contested and pliable, depending on our contemporary conditions while also shaping them. Usually, however, this process of creating historical narratives remains invisible, History seems to unfold automatically and inevitably. The present necessarily follows a path that logically led to exactly this here and now. Cracks in this process, its constructedness and violence become obvious when our perception of the future changes dramatically and abruptly, when the dominant logic of historical development collapses and it seems uncertain what will take its place. The end of the Soviet empire and the German unification 30 years ago represent such disruptions of a taken for granted continuum. They required a rewriting of national and continental memory in reaction to drastically new constellations. The construction of a neoliberal unity out of decades of East-West antagonism posed a serious challenge to, to the emerging pan-European identity, and so did the rapidly growing influence of Germany within the Union. After all, the nation's desire for European dominance had long been considered the driving force behind two world wars devastating the continent. A generation later, the Federal Republic's position as the continent's economic powerhouse and political decision maker is largely undisputed. Still, the transition from the Cold War logic to the current world order was not nearly as smooth and successful for Germany as it might seem. Rather, the chance for real change was missed on all levels. Instead of creating a pluralistic model that allows for a variety of possible forms of Germanness, and thus for diverse memory discourses, Germany and Europe reproduced again what Stuart Hall in 1991 called the continent's internalist story based on an essentialist definition of a white Christian Europe whose identity and history remains neatly separated from the rest of the world. This story necessarily produces a tunnel vision, ignoring and suppress suppressing alternative narratives. It leaves a residue of denied truths and unresolved conflicts that remain unnameable within these dominant discourses, but continue to haunt them. The resulting constant pressure on the coherence of the pervasive model is released in unpredictable ways. This in turn requires new forms of repression, which however can never fully and permanently stabilize the system, leading to regular and largely predictable crises. In fact, as Gassan Hajj observed, the state of permanent crisis seems to have become the very way in which capitalist economies and societies ensure their reproduction. And this accelerated crisis of democracy follows similar patterns. The notion that wealth should translate to power is becoming increasingly explicit again. The commitment to equal rights and equal access is undermined by mainstream rhetorics of entitlement abuse and special rights and divisive identity politics. The groups accused of these rights abuses are framed as outsiders, their presence creating an acute, unforeseeable crisis, destroying a working system. Thus, they need to be expelled in order to end the crisis and to return to the desirable, stable, unified state before they arrived or before they gained rights that they can only misuse. These outsiders are cre created prim primarily through racialization reframing groups that are already present as foreign, fundamentally different, and thus without legitimate claims to participation in and ownership of the society they are part of. For the German case, see for example, how the very same population has been externalized for decades as guest workers, Turks, Muslims. Whenever one category is slightly normalized, another label of foreignness is attached, and amazingly each time, 
there seems to be a collective forgetting of the, these dynamics among the majority. The Turk, who finally almost had become a German Turk, or maybe even a citizen of migrant extraction, again becomes an unrecognizable and incompatible foreigner as soon as the Muslim label is attached to her. This cycle of racial amnesia, which moves from racist panic to forgetting back to panic, suggests the existence of a spatial temporal regime of knowledge management in Germany and Europe as a whole that configures certain populations as displaced and anachronistic through the reproduction of supposed truth on race, religion, and culture. This dislocation, characteristic for the positionality of racialized Europeans, in turn is part of a larger Western system of neoliberal multiculturalism that produces a rhetoric of equality while continuing to treat racial difference as a difference that matters, that is one working to order populations into hierarchies of worthiness. In the European case, the positioning of racialized populations as eternal migrants, permanently stuck in a temporary condition, works to stabilize the fragile and fractured notions of Europeanness leaving intact Hall's internalist story. In order to understand and resist the current dismantling of democratic values in Europe and elsewhere, it is important to acknowledge that these values were always aspirational and inclusion was always contested and conditional. Democracies always coexisted with racism, often explicitly, and not only in the pre-Civil Rights Act United States, but also in Europe. After all, the model of post-national democracy, the European Union was meant to include Europe's colonial empire as subjugated territory. It were the anti-colonial liberation movements that ended this vision, not some kind of European commitment to equality and democracy for non-Europeans. On the contrary, obviously, European democracies were built on the wealth and power secured through centuries of racist exploitation. This is particularly obvious in the perception of refugees and undocumented migrants, especially those classified as economic migrants largely North and West African Muslims and Eastern European Roma, whose deaths by the thousands at Europe's southern and eastern borders is willingly accepted and who face indeterminate internment should they make it into the European Union. By classifying the vast majority of contemporary refugees as undeserving, the focus is turned away from the abject moral and political failure of enlightened Europe. Instead, immobilization and prisons, detention camps, ghettos becomes a normalized response to the presence of mobile populations, be they refugees, migrant, or diasporic minorities such as Roma and Sinti, their supposed state of not belonging offering sufficient justification. In order to answer why this externalization of people of color is so central to supposedly colorblind Europe, it is necessary to ask how the colonial past manifests itself in the post-colonial metropolis and how it impacts the positionality of communities of color. These questions, however, are hardly ever asked, especially in Germany, which believes itself largely untouched by Europe's colonial history. But with this temporal and spatial distancing from colonialism, Germany is of course rather typical for Europe's non-memorialization of its colonial leg legacy. Depending on the nation, the colonial regime was too short to matter in Germany or Sweden, was exceptionally benevolent in the Netherlands or Portugal, or ultimately a civilizing mission that overall greatly benefited the, colon the colonized. That's the French or the British narrative. The collective denial of the relevance and endurance of European colonialism brings me back to the museum island. More specifically, its official website, which traces the island's history from the opening of the old museum in 1830 to the opening of the Pergamon Museum a century later and into the present. I quote, the initial plans for the construction of the museum island Berlin were driven by the humanistic ideals of the Enlightenment that prevailed in the early 19th century. 
there is no a reference to the national socialist period or to the fact that until the unification, the museums were on the territory of the socialist German Democratic Republic. In light of these strategic omissions, it is hardly surprising that colonialism is not mentioned at all. Instead, the island is introduced like this, I quote, situated in the very heart of the city, the museum island Berlin is one of the country's major sites, attracting hundreds of thousands of guests from all over the world each year. This unparalleled museum ensemble was the cradle of today's Staatliche Museen zu Berlin and is where it showcases its magnificent collections of art and cultural artifacts spanning several millennia from Europe and the wider Mediterranean region. This sneaking inclusion of the wider Mediterranean region into Europe's cult cultural heritage is significant on various levels. And it is especially grating since currently the Mediterranean stands for a cultural, economic, religious, religious and political divide that literally marks the world's deadliest border in particular for people from the wider Mediterranean. In the European imagination, the Mediterranean has become to represent an immutable civilizational divide, the incompatibility of Islam and modernity. This is, for example, reflected in increasingly popular references to the continent's Judeo-Christian history which erases both endemic European anti-Semitism and the shared Judeo-Christian Islamic culture projected onto the Eastern Mediterranean, which then is claimed as proto-European in the museum's narrative. In contrast, in its immigration policies, Germany seems hard pressed to see commonalities with the Egypt, Syria, Iraq, that the nation feels so connected to when claiming the region's cultural productions. A claim that is far from uncontested, of course. Egypt, for example, has demanded the return of the Nefertiti bust since 1925. Again, the bust is worth roughly 35 million euros now. When Germany rejected the demand for the last time in 2011, the Under Secretary of Culture declared, I quote, Art is part of the universal human heritage and wherever it is should be made accessible to as many people as possible, end quote. And this accessibility happens to be given in Berlin rather than Cairo and Baghdad, accessibility at least to the people that count since much of the world is not allowed into Europe, especially people from the regions the art was taken from. The issue of stolen cultural artifacts is a small but significant part of the debate around the colonial legacy. The enlightened encyclopedic museum was only possible because Europe, European powers could acquire art for nothing and they continued to profit from it. The new museum without the Nefertiti, the Pergamon without the Ishte gate would constitute not only significant blows to the museum's finances, but also to Berlin's tourism industry and to its status as a global cultural capital. But there's more to this story, namely the 2005 master plan to rebuild the 15th century city palace as a museum to house the tens of thousands of pieces of stolen colonial art from Africa, right across from the museum island. This, to quote from the plan, manifests Berlin's center as a place of universal enlightenment, a place of global art and global competency through Berlin State Museum as the largest existing encyclopedic museum, the Humboldt Forum. Then, the European collection on the museum island will enter a unique dialogue with the non-European collections in the castle area in Berlin's heart. Leaving aside the question why Berlin of all places should be predestined for this, note how the art on the museum island now has become entirely European, despite its partial origin in Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. The non-European collections in the Humboldt Forum represent primitive art 
and primitive cultures from different regions and time periods, but all characterized by their static status as other. In contrast, the quote, European art on the museum island tells a story of progress through space and time from ancient Babylon to 21st century Europe. That is, while the Mediterranean functions as a civilizational divide in the present, it is framed as a civilizational bridge regarding art from ancient civilizations that despite being outside of Europe's supposed political and cultural borders are implied to be more, more closely related to and thus owned by Europe than to that region's contemporary inhabitants. In other words, these regions, or rather their ancient cultures, are integrated into an internalist European narrative, while their contemporary inhabitants and those Europeans descending from them are denied the status of integration. The master plan combining the Humboldt Forum and the Museum Island perfectly encapsulates Europe's internalist story with its unique ability to be both particular and exclusive and universal and at all encompassing, to both claim all the world's cultural productions and resources as, as its own and permanently excluding its citizens of color as internal others. The Humboldt Forum is not only controversial, however, and this is my last point, because it will house tens of thousands of pieces of stolen art. In order to build it, the Palace of the Republic had to be torn down. The Palace of the Republic, in turn, was a visible reminder of something that had little space in the new future-oriented Germany namely the 40 years history of the German Democratic Republic, the parliament of which was housed in the Palace of the Republic. Accordingly, the question whether or not to tear down the palace became symbolic for a highly charged debate on how the United Nation would deal with its socialist heritage. The political decision to not keep the palace as a site of memory and its replacement with an older, less loaded version of German history is symptomatic of the way the United Germany dealt with the nation's shared history. A restored palace of the Republic would have kept alive the memory of more than one Germany, of the existence of more than one version of Germanness. Instead, there's one hegemonic narrative with a straight line leading from 15th century Prussia, or maybe even ancient Babylon, to 20th century capitalist West Germany to 21st century United Capitalist Germany, with fascism as well as East German socialism as brief and ultimately external aberrations. And symptomatic of East European, West European relations in general, while socialist East Germany has ceased to exist, dominant West German discourses identified the failure of East Germans to become instantly Westernized as the reason for the East xenophobia, poverty, political apathy, and general inability to succeed within capitalism. That is, racism becomes a marker of a temporal displacement of East Germans and Eastern Europeans in general, caused by their location in the former sphere of influence of the Soviet empire, which prevented them from advancing towards the tolerant multiculturalism characterizing the continent's Western part. Ironically, this displacement links East Germans and post-colonial migrants, as well as refugees, by framing them all is not quite there yet, as out of time and place in the modern nation. This modern German nation that needs to educate and elevate to integrate both groups, and in the case of the latter, expel those deemed unfit or undeserving. The Mutaka project fits neatly in this narrative. The refugees become candidates for integration into Europe by accepting Europe's discursive and material ownership of their own history, and with it, Europe's claim to controlling their 
and the world's future. Germans, Germany's post-unification memory discourse is symptomatic of that. Past, present, and future intersect in the rebuilding of Berlin's center after the unification. From the redesign of the Potsdamer Platz to the destruction of the East German Palace of the Republic to the ongoing construction of the Humboldt Forum, reclaiming the nation's humanist past by creating the world's largest encyclopedic museum. But of course, there has been considerable controversy around the forum and its message, probably because the colonial link is so obvious. Between 1880 and 1914, when Germany lost its colonies, the collection of African art had grown from a few hundred to 47,000 pieces. And more disturbingly, among the collection are human remains, including those of Herrero murdered in Germany's genocidal war in Namibia in 1904 to 1907. Protests against the Humboldt Forum are spearheaded by the multiracial anti-neocolonial No Humboldt 21, which makes explicit the link between the internalist narrative, the archive, colonialism and racism at home. The No Humboldt 21 Collective is linked to a global movement focused on the repatriation of remains and artifacts stolen during colonialism. And this transnational movement mirrors the transcolonial trait of not only art, but human bodies, bringing Herrera remains to New York and native Hawaiians to Berlin. The collective is also linked to a movement of artists and activists increasingly addressing the complicity of museums, galleries, and other cultural institutions. This movement has an early representation in the 1998 film Die Leere Mitte, The Empty Center, by Jap Japanese German artist and theorist Tito Steyl. The film, The Empty Center, shows that it is possible to use Berlin Center to tell a very different story about Germany and its present pasts. The film focuses on another post-unification prestige project, the Potsdamer Place, a space whose redesign as a high-class shopping mall also radically suppressed the many layers of history present. Steyl uncovers these layers through the stories of those considered un-German in various historical periods, from Jews kept out of the 19th century Berlin city center by a custom border, through migrants from the former colonies hustling in 1920s Berlin, to Vietnamese contract workers in East Berlin and the Polish laborers building the new Potsdamer place in the early 1990s. Steyl begins her film with a quote by Jewish-German cultural critic Siegfried Krakauer, who fled Berlin in 1933 and worked at the Museum of Modern Art while in exile in New York. The quote reads in translation, to found a tradition of lost processes, to give a name to the formerly nameless. Krakauer's words are echoed in queer African-American poet Audre Lorde's discussion of poetry as an essential tool of survival in poetry is not a luxury. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. And where that language does not yet exist, it is our poetry which helps to fashion it. Poetry is not only dream and vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. Shortly after the volume's publication, in 1984, Lord left New York to temporarily move to Berlin, where she became an important mentor to the fledgling Black German movement. The life stories of both Krakauer and Lord offer counter narratives to Europe's internalist story. And both statements quoted resonates with the resistance to a singular narrative of internalist Europeanness that deems all alternative models impossible. Their work, as well as that of Steyl herself, that of No Humboldt 21, and of many others, 
contributes to decolonial European archives recovering these impossible alternatives, giving name to the nameless so it can be thought, working towards what Susan Suleiman calls a crisis of memory, that is a conflict over the interpretation and public understanding of an event firmly situated in the past but whose after effects are still deeply felt. In this case, the after effects of European colonialism and the resulting ongoing system of global racial capitalism, which produces the ongoing need to decolonize Europe. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Um, yeah, thank you. This discussion or this kind of mapping of how heritage or patrimony sites become policed or are policed and how that policing is related to the policing of borders, um, I think elaborates on why we might have been spending the last two days talking about the policing of public space and as something that is relevant to a discussion around memory. So, um, we've got time, we've got about eight minutes and I, and I just wanted to pick up on this last point about counter narratives. Um, your work is, is very useful for thinking about counter narratives. Um, it, it is in, in itself a kind of um, counter narrative to the, as you say, internalist narratives um, of European historical memory. Um, and it also focuses on practices uh, mostly of European communities of color, um, directly engaged with kind of art, activism, poetry, as also directly engaging with discourses on historical memory. And yet there's a kind of hierarchy, hierarchization or silencing of these practices as um, historically, or as producing historical knowledge there seems to be kind of two counter narratives. And I just want to, my question is around, what are your thoughts at, at the moment, apart from what you've already said on, on this notion of a counter narrative? Um, I think there, well, a counter narrative is, is different from the kind of narrative that can be integrated into a larger narrative to make it more diverse, or, which is kind of the idea behind behind this multicultural model, right? And and I think what I see as counter narratives are those that don't really make sense in the existing system because and therefore cannot be included, which is why they are marginalized, but at the same time to me it seems that they have the the potential to lead to a further destabilization of the existing system to produce a new one in which all those counter narratives can coexist together. Okay. Um, just, just before checking if anyone here wants to ask a question, um, there hasn't been anything coming through on YouTube, but I just wanted to share and also with the idea of closing, um, closing the program, the Dissenting History program, and also moving on to Ikram Bulum's sound action, um, which is directly preceding your talk, Fatima. Um, just wanted to pick up and connect with what you've just said to a couple of comments uh, in the morning in the methodologies table and also the, um, the public space or spaces and technologies of memory uh, roundtable debate. Um, it, I think Esther Mayoko said um, it's not about it's not about generating alternatives to the official memory. It's about writing better stories or generating a better a better memory, a better history. I think that kind of connects with what you're saying about you know it not not being included. It's not about including an alternative or another history. Um, and something that Maricela and Catalina mentioned, uh, which I think is interesting in relation to, to your talk, Fatima, is that um, memory as a practice would, would have to include a kind of break with the, with the present or, uh, or is the practice of producing new subjectivities in the present. So a migrant memory in Europe 
uh, would break necessarily with the category of migrant as it has been constructed. Um, yeah. Does anyone have a question for Fatima Al Tayeb? We're quite a small public as audience, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's like. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us from San Diego. And I know it's morning there, so um, we're wishing you a good day. And Thanks. is there anything, yeah, that you'd like to say apart from goodbye or? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, well, I mean, not really. I, I, I can, can just say a word about what you, what you summarized right now about the earlier discussions, which I um, totally agree with. So I do hope it, has, it has, was a bit of a, of a good bit. I think that the European memory discourse is tied to a, to a larger system of control that cannot that pretends to work with inclusion, but it will never include us to our benefit because it's fundamentally racist. So yes, this, this system needs to be exploded, which also means that the memory discourse as it exists needs to be um, completely reframed. But of course, there are already many populations who have a memory discourse that is in complete um, clash with the existing narrative. That's what creates this tension, right? That creates instability that then leads to repression and, and, and to resistance again. So that is both the, what is so um, stressful uh, living in a world where you confronted with an overpowering narrative, be it you're a ref refugee and you look at the result of centuries of colonial theft, but this is presented to you as an alternative to your present, which also is an outcome of this colonial past, right? So you're forced to basically embrace your own oppression in order to be included. But um, there's also a potential for resistance, right? Because this is a connection between many communities that are not necessarily always in in conversation with each other so i see that also as as a potential for the future and um other than that i can only say i hope that we'll see each other again in person some point in the near future and um thank you so much for having me thank you so much and i hope i hope we can welcome you to barcelona soon there's some applause <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Great. Bye. Thank you.